welcome. My name is Kathy Miller, and I'm a longtime member of Edwards, and I'd like you to welcome you to worship with us today. Here at Edwards, we have joined together to be part of a community that worships and serves God. Join us for the next little while to worship God. Join us this week as we just discuss together our fiscal responsibilities as a Christian community on Wednesday at 1030 and 630 at our normal Bible study time. I would like to ask for your help. I would like to invite you to help feed the local hungry families this Thanksgiving. We usually do a great food drive for the Thanksgiving baskets we give away each year. This year, we're going to have to be a bit different due to COVID. We will accept payments and pledges for the baskets. There'll be more information following in constant contact. So now, whoever you are and wherever you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. Jesus came to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of God's favor. This week, our scripture speaks of storing up treasures in heaven. We will see that the treasures Jesus speaks of are the riches that come with the outpouring of relationship, love, grace, and hospitality. These things are uncorruptible rather than the accumulation of things that can become false gods. How we spend our treasures of time, energy, and money indicates what we love, what we value, how we want to impact the world. This week, we are invited to become more courageous, intentional, and visionary about how we serve the world through what we spend.
Today's scripture is the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Listen for a word of God. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where mo neither moth nor rust consume, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart is also. The eye of the, is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of the Lord. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Lord, of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my peace. serving as the intern pastor here at Edwards Congregational United Church of Christ. Today, I'm filling in for Pastor Lisa Gaston as she enjoys a little time of leisure and rest this week. I'm so blessed to be with you all today for this sermon portion of our worship service. So, three recently departed souls are in line to for the pearly gates. The first one tells St. Peter, as a pediatrician, I help thousands of children. St. Peter lets him enter. The second one says, I was the lead doctor in a free health clinic in the poorest section of my city. St. Peter tells him to go ahead. The last man says, I was an HMO manager. I got countless families cost-effective health care. You may enter, said St. Peter, adding, but you can only stay for three days, and after that, you'll have to find other accommodations. <laughs> I love starting my sermons with a little comedy relief, but it's easy to see how relevant that joke is in our world today. It seems more and more that in today's society, money dictates how we survive in this world and how we view all that is around us, and even how we relate to each other as together we navigate through this journey we call life. But before we delve into how we might relate to all this money stuff, and better yet, how we might find a better sense of our spiritual relationship with money, let us go before God in prayer. Most holy, awesome God of many names and many currencies, may these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and valuable unto you and your children. Amen. I must admit, when Pastor Lisa provided me with a theme for this month's liturgy, and then asked me to preach a sermon that aligns with the spirituality of money, I found myself at a loss. I mean, really, money as a spiritual component to our walk with God? that seemed to contradict everything I had ever heard and reflected upon in my life, in seminary, and especially what I see in our world today. But I love a good challenge, so I prayed about it, and as usual, my entire week was full of giant flashes of messages, conversations, and even another sermon I heard about faith and money. So here's a synopsis of all that I have discovered about how money can be tied directly to our healthy spiritual practices when we choose to walk with Jesus. First, the bad stuff. 
I've never been good with money, as the old saying goes. It seems I never seem to have enough money to do the things everyone else is doing, unless by some graceful act, someone is foolish enough to extend me credit. When that happens, inevitably my employer shuts down their business, or I'm sideswiped by a gang member being chased in a high-speed chase by police. And we all know gang members have the best insurance plans on their getaway cars. That's a true story, by the way. But I'm gonna cut myself some slack here a bit as I dig deeper into those two reasons, or some might say excuses, why I've struggled with money. Let's start with the big picture. Our current system of capitalism in the United States, which is sadly intertwined with Christianity at various intersections, doesn't always value the things that are truly valuable. Theologian Carter Hayward writes, during the last two centuries in the predominantly Christian West, the more self-absorbed impulses in Christian thought have merged in significant ways with the aims of the dominant economic system, which reaches far beyond the wildest dreams of common folk and wish to be able to make a living and earn a decent wage. What this means is that many of us are absorbed in how we may better the self while potentially neglecting ideas of righteousness, such as love, grace, and generosity. Perhaps we've misinterpreted the role of money and confused treasures in heaven by instead measuring our worth in God's eyes by how many treasures we have here on earth. Let's face it. We all have found ourselves envying the man with the beautiful wife or vice versa, the boat, the sports car, the luxury crossover in the garage, 2.5 kids with college funds, a healthy dog, the planned trip to Disney, and of course, the big screen TV with sound boosters. We wonder what he or she or they have done to be so successful. We may even say they are blessed. So indeed, our ideas of being God-blessed amidst a profit-driven economy are fueling the same self-absorbed ideology that somehow we are judged by our treasures on earth, as if God only blesses us with stuff, and those with the most stuff are God's favorites. And just how does that type of spiritual ideology manifest itself in our world? First, it trickled trickles down at times to make us fear not having enough money and putting ourselves into the throes of depression and anxiety. Or for some of us, it leads us into a ritual of hoarding more and more money as if we're playing some game where the winner is the one with the most earthly treasures in the end. After all, many of us grew up playing the board game Monopoly where the only one with all the money in the end wins the game. But just how does one get all the money in the game of Monopoly? Yep, by taking it all from the other players. I told you earlier that those messages for this sermon came a-flashing at me during this week. Well, one of those came when I decided to log on for our weekly Wednesday noon reflections that are given through my seminary. I'll tell you, when I'm in Chicago on Wednesdays, I am always at my seminary to attend those services. But when I'm not in Chicago, I have really good intentions to watch the streaming versions, or more recently during the pandemic, the Zoom cooperatives from home. But most often, I forget conveniently, if you know what I mean. But this past Wednesday, I decided to log on because one of my favorite professors was delivering the message. Unbeknownst to me ahead of time, the topic was faithful stewardship within a capitalistic society. Uh-huh. I tell you, God does have a sense of humor, indeed. In that discussion, we heard about this unhealthy attachment to money on a systemic level and has, how that's been exposed during this pandemic. That darkness of which Jesus spoke about in our scripture today. During that session, we heard the story of how one Chicago pizza parlor laid off five of its workers in May, citing a shortage of business. When those drivers returned, there were only four drivers. You see, the real reason they were laid off was because one of the drivers had tested positive for COVID 
and rather than incite alarm within the community and potentially suffer revenue losses, they thought it better to keep that under wraps. They didn't inform the other drivers of the possible exposure to COVID, and upon learning about the fifth driver's infection, they all got tested, and they all tested positive. The spread from those four drivers was mammoth and most likely contributed to the infections of hundreds and the deaths of others. And the fifth driver, he didn't return to work because he died in the two-week layoff period. That story reminded me also of the executive order passed earlier this year, forcing low-wage meatpacking plant workers to return to work to close-quartered, unsafe conditions, despite the knowledge of hundreds of COVID-positive tests among those very workers. The desire to increase profits here led to the deaths of thousands of the essential workers by forcing them to produce meat, not necessarily essential to our diets, in unsafe working conditions. Work or be fired. These stories and how they relate to money and greed of business owners and leaders are exactly what Jesus meant when he said how terrible that darkness will be when we try to serve two masters. There is a reason Jesus spoke out against greed and the evils of misused money 44 times in the Gospels, way more than he spoke about the things some would focus upon as sin in our churches today. And throughout the Bible, we read things like, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. That's in 1 Timothy 6.10. In Hebrews 13.5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And finally, in Proverbs 22.7, and one all I know all too well, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. So maybe this all means that we should just stay away from money. After all, it sounds like it's just plain evil. Well, that's kind of impossible now, isn't it? First, we need money to survive. And if it were that simple, my sermon would be over. But aside from that, we are talking about it's a wonderful life a story that finds its entire theme in how one's life touches other lives. So there has to be some positive, valuable lesson here about money, correct? There's a quote from the movie that goes like this. You've been given a great gift, George, a chance to see what the world would be like without you. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives, and when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? So when we dissect this quote and combine it with the notion that our gospel lesson is embedded in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a sermon that speaks to more good than it does bad, it becomes a foregone conclusion that somehow our heavenly treasures may be gained by how we are in relationship with money. Additionally, we should examine how our vision for our presence impacts this world based upon how we use our assets to build right relationships now and even when we depart this space. A couple weeks ago, I sat in on one of your council meetings and I was awestruck when I heard your pastor speak of our spiritual connection to money. It took me a while at first to ascertain what she meant by that but I think it has to do with how we spend our money or how we react towards money. What is valuable in our minds and how do we approach the lack or the excess of it? Do we fear? Do we hoard? Do we trust? Are the things we use it for corrupt? Are they perishable, foolish? Those are some tough questions. I think of my own experience of going to seminary. I applied, I had the grades, I had the calling, I had the support, I had the desire. What I didn't have was the money. But I fought, I hesitated, I squawked, I cried. What would happen 
if I didn't answer God's call to ministry. So finally I decided to just do it. But I had to think, like George from the movie, would I even be missed if I didn't go? Well, I knew I would miss out if I did not go. And after spending a few years there, I have had some affirmations that yes, I would have been missed. I'm pretty well appreciated among the faculty there. Last year, I won a very significant award of recognition being named a Castaneda Scholar. And most recently, I've been embarking upon constructing a new theological basis for a paradigmatic shift that could potentially benefit many, many Christians in our world. All these things are matters I could have not possibly known in the beginning and would have never known had I not planted that seed of trust. Of course, I still worry about how I'll ever pay off my student loans, but again, there's that thing about the courage and the intentional vision leading us through whenever we use our gifts for righteousness. Looking into ourselves is where the process begins as we ask how we could affect the world for the good by offering our resources, our time, our talents, and yes, our money with my vision, with your vision, and even those visions we cannot begin to see. And that brings me to my final point. What about those things on which we are encouraged to spend our money that we may never ever get to see, or that are so far off in the future, it's impossible to know the result of our fruitful giving? Perhaps this whole trust thing just doesn't jive with your financial planner mindset. After all, what's the payoff? Well, Jesus reminded us that where our heart is, there is our treasure. And it is much easier to understand our relationship with money when we can see how the tangible results of our spending relate to those righteous treasures of our heart. Things like the food we donate to the hungry, the candy we donate to the trunk treatment. But what about the results that we cannot see? I remember a beloved and now departed minister friend of mine speaking about why he donated money to mission work and charitable causes. He would say, I donate to those causes because my money alone cannot meet the larger needs in our world. But when my donations supplement the donations of others, my money is able to go to the places I can't go. For example, my heart cries out at the possibility of extinction with some of our big cats in this world. You can ask my mother about my lifelong affection toward tigers, lions, cheetahs, panthers, leopards, etc. She knew that I ever went missing at a zoo that most likely I'd wandered off to the big cat exhibits. Fortunately, she also knew not to let me wander off because I may have tried to give some tiger a big cuddly hug, and that would not have turned out so well. But today, I know that I myself could not possibly save all my big kitty friends, but my annual donation to the World Wildlife Foundation will be affected when it joins all the other donations, and it can travel to India and Africa and hope to save my furry friends. But there is that other idea I mentioned concerning how our investments today may work toward a vision we have for the future that perhaps we will not be even able to envision yet today. I want to share with you the story of Honi from the Jewish town. Honi was known as the circle maker among the Jewish people for reasons too lengthy to explain here. But there's a story about Honi that involves a 70 year math. It goes like this. One day, Honey was journeying on the road, and he saw a man planting a carrot tree. He asked, how long does it take for this tree to bear fruit? The man replied, 70 years. Honey then further asked him, are you certain that you will live another 70 years? The man replied, I found already grown carrot trees in the world. As my forefathers planted those for me, so I too plant these for my children. 
When he sat down to have a meal, and sleep overcame him. As he slept, the rocky formation closed upon him, which hid him from sight, and he slept for seventy years. When he awoke, he saw a man gathering the fruit of the carob tree, and Horny asked him, Are you the man who planted the tree? The man replied, I am his grandson. Thereupon Horny exclaimed, It is clear that I have slept for seventy years. He then caught sight of his own mule, which had given birth to several generations of mules, and he returned home. There he inquired, Is the son of Honey, the circle drawer, still alive? The people answered him, His son is no more, but his grandson is still living. Thereupon he said to them, I am Honey, the circle drawer, but no one would believe him. You see, the lesson in that involves how Honey recognized the significance in planting the tree, not for himself, but for future generations. of the seeds planted long before you arrived here. One of the benefits of serving as an intern pastor is that I get to say things that a congregation's paid regular pastor is often hesitant to say. I already know how most pastors despise talking about stewardship, but I get to leave after a few months, so well, you know. Perhaps today, you're wondering why you should continue to take a month to make a monetary commitment to this community of faith if we can't even use this gorgeous facility during this time of pandemic. Perhaps you are one of those who are eager to restart services simply out of the fear that people will cease their giving if they can't even come to church anymore. You're not alone. I hear it at my own home church. I hear it from other pastors in the community. Folks want to worship together in the place their hard-earned money has helped to build, even during the most risky time to do so would be right now. Or maybe you're getting up there in age and wonder, why should I commit my money when in reality, I could be checking out of this world pretty soon. In both those dynamics I just spoke about, of questioning our monetary commitments, let us learn from Honey. If our treasures lie in the intent to offer Jesus' good news teachings to others, then it may not be others presently around us that are always the recipients. This church has a history of progressive ministries that have benefited this community even today. And likewise, the seeds we plant today will be reaped not only when we get the all clear to return to church, but even when you and I are long gone from this world, what we plant today will hopefully create a better place for LGBTQ Christians, immigrant Christians, racially diverse Christians, female Christians, all Christians of tomorrow, as we continue to build a diverse church that tears down the systemic structures of oppression now tomorrow, next year, and so on and so on. Isn't that where our heart's treasures can be found? Not in building a building that we use today, but in a community that endures forever. I want to leave you with another Jewish component to today's message. You're about to watch a music video of a Hebrew hymn called the Ami Bato. Take time to listen, follow along with the English translation, and join me in working today to make tomorrow's work possible. Amen. Ja. 
of it all. Were you more aware this week of wonderful? To be in a wonderful life is to live that life in wonder and all the gifts surrounding us each and every moment. Today I ask that you reflect upon these images of God's creations. As you see the wonder and beauty given to us by our God, I want you to share the words of a prayer that comes from my Lakota Sioux ancestors. Lakota Sioux Chief Yellow Lark translated the prayer into English in 1887. Sit back and imagine. O oh, Great Spirit, Holy God, whose voice we hear in the winds and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear us. We need your strength and wisdom let us walk in beauty and make our eyes ever hold the red and purple sunset. Make our hands respect the things you have made and our ears sharp to hear your voice. Make us wise so that we understand the things you have taught us, your people. Let us learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and under every rock. Help us remain calm and strong in the face of all that comes toward us. Help us find compassion without empathy overwhelming us. We seek strength, not to be greater than anyone else, but to fight our greatest enemy, our own selves. Make us ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes. So when life fades, as the fading sunset, our spirits may come to you without shame. Let us continue our prayers, creating God for the awesome wonders of creation, the abundant feast of family and friends, the plentiful riches of your presence among us. We give thanks. We are all so, so grateful, grateful oh God. God. What kind of things are we grateful for? I'm grateful for my church and the family that I have here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve at this church. I'm grateful to have a roof over my head and food in my stomach. Amen. 
And I'm grateful for God's intervention, helping my three family members that have been affected by COVID get through it. I am grateful to be able to pray every morning with people from all over the world. I'm praying for you. Thank you, God, for your relationship with me. Loving God for those times that feel rife with heartbreak, too much stress, and too little assurance, a plethora of pain and not enough possibility. Be with us. We lift to you, O oh God, what kind of things are we concerned about? Baby Beckett, may he thrive and grow. Myla Smith and Chuck Collins and my friend Reverend Lynn Young who has COVID and in the hospital. And any people that are out there that are suffering from the pandemic in financial ways, in health ways, or any way. I'm concerned about our climate as I look at all these beautiful trees. What would we be without it? I'm concerned for all the natural disasters in the world. The flood, the fires, the wind, and the storm. God, keep people from harm. We also pray for Arabella, Dan, Donnie, Howard, Kelly, Herb, and Merrill. We also lift up Brian and Jane, Lou and Norma, Martha and Richard, Rosie and Mandy. What are you concerned about today? We lift it to God. Gracious God, for those times when our contributions bring more negativity than positivity, more resentment than forgiveness, more breaking down than lifting up, forgive us. In this silence, we open the books of our hearts and make an accounting. Already we know that you have balanced the ledgers. You hold nothing against us. You forgive all debts. We are so deeply grateful and we commit to create more good in the world. And Holy One, Wrap us in your spirit's tether as together we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our, Our creator, creator in, in heaven, heaven and all and around all us, holy, holy is your name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done on, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our, our sins, sins as, as we forgive, forgive those who sin against us. us. Lead us lead not us into not temptation, temptation, but deliver us, us from, from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the, kingdom, the power, and the, and the glory, glory forever. forever Amen. Amen. The support I have received over the years has lifted me through some tough times. 
I pledge because I want to make sure others have the opportunity to receive that support. Our church is changing, as is everything in our lives, and I intend to change with it. If you look back, our church has always been changing, whether it was moving up from downtown, adding the organ to the sanctuary, or the recent building addition. We developed a web page, thank you, Woody Perkins, for an online presence. And now we are putting our entire service online. Did anyone envision that 10 years ago? That's what Edwards has always been about, change. We are not afraid of it, we embrace it. I look forward to helping our church reach more people to spread the word of Jesus, of goodness, kindness, and giving. After all, isn't that what we as Christians are called to do? And what I have a sense of wonder about is how during this terrible time, this pandemic, we all came together to keep connected, to keep our church going, even though we can't meet in person. And what I also wonder, no, what I know is that whatever the future throws at us, we will come together to meet the challenge. I am so grateful that Edwards Congregational United Church of Christ is part of my wonder-filled life. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, there's a toast that will serve as a blessing throughout our series. George and Mary genuinely, generously help one Italian family, the Martinis, move into their new home in Bailey Park, where four room frame homes are built as housing for immigrant families. Mary and George offer a brief speech at a housewarming party uh, symbolically holding up a loaf of bread, a box of salt, and a bottle of wine. Bread, that this house may never know hunger. Salt, that life may have flavor. And wine, that joy and prosperity may be forever in your home. The bread of life is the true sustenance that God brings. The fruit of the vine is the love poured out through Jesus Christ, a sign of the never-ending grace that is ours now and forever. And we have been called to be salt of the earth so that all might savor the spice of life that is the Holy Spirit's presence among us. These symbols carry messages from our own faith journeys. And you have been reminded of these things here in our time together. Now go forth, do likewise into the world, because it is a wonderful life.